what what did you do after your PhD? Well, again, I followed a, an easy track because Leslie Orgel, mm. oh, yes. who sadly died recently, um, was well known had, as an ex-Cambridge theoretical chemist. He was well known to Colin Rees and many other people here. And it was quite a routine for people to suggest to their graduate students that they might like to do a postdoc with Leslie. And so it seems a fun thing to do. So, so the, the connection with, with Leslie is that he was working on prebiotic chemistry, origin of life, though it was very far from life, but working on chemical reactions that might have some bearing on, on the origin of life spontaneously from non-living material. And it had to do, um, the bit I was working on had to do with potential replication of nucleic acid things or nucleic acid-like things, the information of biology. And this fitted perfectly with the sorts of things I'd been doing. So I was hired as a postdoc, and um, this was tremendous fun. In fact, it was very great fun for me because I was now uh, catapulted out of a situation where I was really working for Colin to a place where I was expected to work more on my own, but nevertheless was treated as a as a um, as a, well, a close discussant, shall I say, of Leslie. And I got quite a lot of invitations to his house to meet visiting scholars who were, who were coming to see him. And um, I think I was a little bit spoiled, actually. <laughs> and, you know, you want to get to quite big for one's boots with all this attention. You never met Paul Dirac, did you? Yes, yes, you I did, did through, through Daphne and Monica, oh. because we had, um, we had parties uh, occasionally around him. What was he like? He, he was, it's reputed a very shy man. Or? He was, yes, he was quite a retiring figure. I got to him a little bit more because he discovered that I had a facility for fixing uh, radios. And I was called around once or twice to fix Paul Tracks radio, which we still possess. Now that, it's very large though, it's probably too big for you. And anyway, no, it's not. no, no, that would be... Paul Dirac's radio, oh, do you want that? yes, it's why not? <laughs> right. I'll write it yeah. down to remind you. have sort of two... Two mementos in one. Yes, exactly. That was All right. wonderful. I've so I fixed this thing quite a few yeah. times. And of course, it was, you know, if one knew anything, it was easy to fix things in those days because they were bits of wire. You know, there was nothing hidden about mm. it. Mm. Um, so, I, yes, I did get to know him a little. But, he, I mean, he was, he was intellectually, of course, mm. a different, different world for me. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I can't remember our conversations, but we must have talked a bit. And I was this young, young research student. It was mm. great, great to meet him. Um, yeah, so, so on to California, to Leslie, had a wonderful time there, had a daughter born there accidentally. Which, which part of, which university? Ah, so, so, well, Leslie was based in the Salk Institute, hmm. the, um, and the history of that is not university as such, but when Jonas Salk uh, produced the first polio vaccine hmm. um, with charitable money, it was an enormous success, and money absolutely poured in. Was a thing called the March of Dimes, which had actually paid for some, if not all, of his research. And the, somehow the charity continued, and the money kept on pouring in. So they started an institute in his name with some of the money. And so it was, it was this, this amazing structure was built on a cliff edge just north of San Diego, near La Jolla, actually. Beautiful spot. And um, they started to appoint fellows and uh, visiting students and so forth, like me, came. Leslie actually encouraged me to apply for a permanent fellowship there hmm. after well, coming back to Cambridge for a while. Um, but in the end, we decided to stay because um, the, 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 the deal was that, that Leslie, once again, was, uh, was a friend of, of Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. Sidney Brenner was looking for, um, to, for staff to, to expand his work, which is just beginning on the little nematode, Senior Abditus. And so Leslie uh, sort of arranged that I would come back here for a year or so to learn something from Sydney's work. But having got here and started to work on this little worm and sort of got settled into Cambridge, we rather liked it and got, got kept on here. So we never did go back to the salt. Um, have I you, have got the easy transitions in both cases. I mean, in have you ever thought of working in America? I mean, you were. You yes, uh, we. I think at the time, for family reasons, we um, both felt it would be quite good to be in this country because our parents were here and they, they, now our second child had arrived and it was, uh, just seemed attractive to, to, to be here. I th certainly, if there hadn't been any opportunity, 
you know, nowadays, I might well have found it tougher to get a job. As it was, the, the expanding laboratory of molecular biology with lots of um, staff posts available, competitive, but available for the, with the Medical Research Council meant that we, we, were, we were able to stay. Um, I think that was, the, so these sort of domestic reasons were probably the primary push at the time. Later on over the years, and perhaps Daphne rather ahead of me on this, there was a definite sense that we'd rather be in this country, you know, what we didn't like. The, the, the increasing the illiberal uh, trend of, of America as, as things went on. And, um, it's sort of ironic now because our daughter, having been born in California, is in fact a dual citizen and she went back to America and in fact um, was, a stu was a research student there in Berkeley. Um, so after she got her PhD, um, she continued her relationship with a fellow research student she, she met there. Uh, they married and they um, lived for a while in uh, in uh, San Francisco. Then they moved to New York because she got the job in the New York Hall of Science as an exhibitor. And the they're, now they've, however, moved to Vancouver, which is where they've settled. So they're out of America again. There's quite a lot of feeling in the family about American politics and where one wants to actually live. Mm. And this has grown up over the years, and it's shared by you know her and, and indeed her husband too, and, and all of us. Um, and so there's a, there's a slight sense that America is not the best place in the world to live. It's all a bit silly, actually, because, of course, every country has all sorts of people in. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you know, you're affected, perhaps, by the way the majority vote into feeling more or less comfortable. Well, I was going to just, I mean, people do talk about their politics sometimes. What, what is your political position, generally? With, yeah. I'm, I, I think it's fair to say I'm, I'm a left-winger. I have somebody who's... <laughs> it went with the it went with the the other aspects of my early education from my parents as as, as being expected to help with the Conservative Party. <laughs> <laughs> part of my rebellion was obviously political as well. Mm. And I think it's fair to say I've moved steadily left throughout my life rather than steadily right, which is more common. Mm. I've probably been urged and abetted quite a bit of this with Daphne, who's very staunch um, left winger. Basically, Labour's party, party supporter, although we're both extremely uncomfortable with the with the Blairite, Blairite uh, trend that we see with New Labour. Mm. As a pragmatic issue, we both vote pretty consistently Lib Dem because there is absolutely zero hope of getting a Labour candidate mm. in South Cambridgeshire, where mm. we are. City, of course, is different, but mm. outside the city, it's extremely conservative, mm. and the Lib Dems are number two and represent a little bit more of a liberal mm. uh, view. So we vote for them. Hmm. Oh, they don't get in any either. Hmm. I'm coming back to America, having made the proviso that there are many people in America and many of them are very estimable and sympathetic and so on. But what is it about American politics that, or society that is, it has increasingly worried you? Well, the foreign policy really, as, in, as America has adopted its, its, its role of, of the leading imperial power, which of course has been exacerbated by the end of the Cold War and the excesses. And my comment, our comments about New Labour is that, of course, the UK has enthusiastically joined in with the most recent adventures. Mm. And I, I regard these as, as the most dangerous things going on in the world today, and extremely dangerous to the survival of humanity, both directly, um, but also indirectly, because they make it more difficult to come to agreements over such things as climate change. And I think we need to adopt a much more holistic view, as it were, of international affairs than, than we do at the moment. Th now, I mean, I think America, I mean, America is, is doing nothing differently from what Britain did in its heyday as an imperial power. Um, very much the same sort of um, mixture, I suppose. Um, there certainly will be additional domestic discomfort in living in, in the parts of America where uh, for example, there are fights over the teaching of evolution in schools. And I suppose, actually, and maybe, maybe the most important thing is coming last, which is just a whole lifestyle thing, that in this country, still, although it's possibly deteriorating a bit, we tend to regard people not really so much as how much they earn. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a pressure to, to, be, to be spending money visibly. 
um, which you find quite a bit in America, even among people that one likes as academics, they seem to need expensive stuff, and mm. not to have this, 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 this slightly ascetic view that mm. I'm generalising hopelessly, mm. obviously. Mm. Uh, but it, it ends up with the sort of people you know, the sort of people you feel comfortable with. We could perfectly well have settled in America. We have lots of friends there. Mm. And it's, it's just an explanation of how one makes these sort of major decisions, but they're based on rather trivial balances of consideration. And very, as I said in the beginning, very opportunistic, really. Most of all, we definitely regard ourselves as citizens of the world, which is that silly phrase, but it's true. I mean, we could undoubtedly settle down and try and find ourselves comfortable anywhere because we would create our own world around us with the circle. And many of our friends, of course, anywhere in, in other parts of the world. So it becomes, in the end, a, a, a matter of convenience more than anything. Talking of citizens of the world, do you spend much time in Asia? Because um, India or China or Japan? Yes. Slightly increasing, I suppose. Although, well, I went to Japan a few times um, beginning. I've been to China couple of times not long ago to do with um, I guess the genome really mm. is the reason for that um, India once I've just agreed to be on a on, a, on some sort of advisory board for the, um, the princess in Thailand mm. uh, for her foundation I visited there once under the auspices of the British Council not long ago and uh, gave a talk and got invited now David Weatherall is also on this advisory team. So he, he wrote a nice letter which persuaded me. It's quite extraordinary, it's quite a trend nowadays. When people want you to do something, they not only invite you directly, but they find somebody that they think you might admire to write a letter of as well. So. <laughs> it's a <laughs> trick which is only just intruding on me. <laughs> Maybe this has always happened, and they're just doing it to me now. <laughs> as you get become more important. Uh, you know, I drop names of friends of yours so, uh, and then persuade you to come here, but... Um, uh, Indeed. I mean, just on that point of, of the rest of the world, uh, I discussed with some people um, the rise of China in relation to science and, yes. and so on. Do you have any thoughts about um, whether it is going to be a serious scientific player soon, or is already? I think it will be increasingly important. I, I think that China has... I think China now understands... Chinese Academy of Sciences, that mm. is, and the people who fund them, now understand that it's no good just sending Chinese abroad because, of course, if they're bright, they stay there and make mm. their careers on the west coast of America or wherever they happen to be. And then what you have to do is to establish centres of excellence in the country and attract the diaspora to some degree back again and, indeed, attract foreigners back mm. again. And I remember my first visit to China when, in fact, we were launching the book. It was Georgina Ferry and I touring around, and I gave various talks and CAS and so on. Name the book. So Sorry, the, the book is called The Common Thread, okay. and it's a story of the, um, the events around the human genome, which is very interesting socially and politically. Mm. Um, so my, uh, the, the launch of this meant that I was asked to give various talks, and, and, and people asked me, CAS what I thought, they asked the same question and I, I gave this answer at that time and it, not because of me but I think because the trend was already well established they are in fact doing exactly that which is to build the sense of excellence and people are going back. Whether or not they continue to fund in a sufficiently open way because of course this, this, is, a, this is a sort of command economy mm. and this intrudes into all sorts of life, uh, whether or not they, they manage to fund in an open enough way to, um, to, to have people do seriously new things and get their, their much craved Nobel Prize and all the rest of it, or whether this will be largely driven into, into utilitarian matters, I don't know. But I would have thought they'll probably do both because it's a wealthy country and it, it's smart, they're smart enough to see their way forward. India is, of course, already doing this in, its, in a very Indian way, in the sense which it cares not at all about equality. Mm. But at the, obviously at the, the uh, top end of, of spend and, and, and brilliance in India, there's very good science going on. Other, other Asian countries are very keen. Uh, South Korea is quite desperate to, to move forward in this way. Mm. And uh, Singapore, of course, uh, which Sydney Brenner has, mm. has a great deal to do with, is, um, is very important and, 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 in fact, rather fancies itself as a hub of the area. Mm. So there's all sorts of initiatives going forward which are important mm. and, and will, in fact, I think, lead to a great deal more high-quality work coming out of Asia in the future. 
Good. Um, let's come back to um, Sydney and, and the MRC. Was he head of the MRC by this time when he... No, he was not. Um, Max Perutz was head and Sydney was, I guess when I arrived, that's right, he would be joint head with Francis Crick mm. of the Cell Biology Division, which I joined. Mm. And as well as being head of it, he was, he was greatly expanding his group um, on, on, the, on, the back, on his back of an envelope plan to exploit <laughs> his little nematode worm, which was quite a joke <laughs> for most it? people. I mean, tell me the joke, was it just... Well, the joke was that Sydney's worm hmm. was supposed to... Was this worm really going to do anything new? I mean, in particular, people who worked on Drosophila, the fruit hmm. fly, were pretty scornful because they had a very good model already and they did not see the point of introducing a new model. It wasn't wholly new. Um, there, there was um, a lab in France, there was a lab on the West Coast, a man called Doughty, where Sydney actually got his stocks from, who uh, were already working on this little worm. But it's quite remarkable, uh, the, the, tremendous, um, the tremendous representation of what Sydney can do is that when he came in and just worked personally on it with a couple of assistants for five years, he just completely uh, revolutionised what was going on and turned this thing into a, a powerful model and began then to attract um, postdocs from, who, who were very serious about about making big careers. So Bob Horvitz, for example, was one of the first of these. And Bob Horvitz... Who you shared the Nobel Prize with. Who I shared with the Nobel Prize with, along with Sydney, mm. um, was not going to join anything that couldn't clearly be seen to, to be delivering something important in science. I was much more of a casual recruit. I'd come because of the connection with Leslie. I was fiddling around. I could see that there were potentials, but I wasn't making such a, a serious decision as, as Bob Horvitz was. But a lot of people like Horvitz made this decision and moved in, and this, this really began to enlarge the field around 1969-70 when I arrived. So, but basically from the 1965, when Sydney picked up this almost unknown animal, deliberately as a new model for developmental biology, for the genetics of developmental biology, working on the genetics, cutting sections, Nicole Thompson, who used to work for Lord Rothschild, then moved to work for Sydney, uh, as an electron microscopist, working with Muriel Wigby as his assistant in the genetics lab, just this little group put together a, a really convincing um, set of mutations and hints about why these mutations might be important in development that proved to, to set the worm on its feet. It was <laughs> Can you set a worm on its feet? Set on its feet, <laughs> yes, yes, well, set on its academic feet. Yes. <laughs> um. So many things to ask. Um, on Sydney, I mean, there's two sides. One is he, ha I've known him for, since I first became a fellow in 1971. He's a very powerful personality. Hugely um, charismatic. And charismatic and a great talker. Yes. Um, but couldn't always have been an easy person to work with. Well, for a long time I, I got along fine, and that's because I was very low key. Mm -hmm. You must remember that I, was, I had no ambition. I was a bench monkey, and um, the people who had ambition were coming through as postdocs, people like Bob Horvitz, mm -hmm. uh, going off and, and starting their own labs, and so I was no threat to Sydney, mm -hmm. and I, I worked quite very quietly and got a few things done. In fact, again at the time, um, after the initial fun, I increasingly felt during the 70s that I actually wasn't getting enough done, because... I could see these uh, people sort of going through and apparently sort of doing all sorts of clever things and then going off and I, I didn't sort of see what I was doing as, as either clever or particularly useful. In fact, looking back, I, I got a great deal done during the 70s and all sorts of foundations were laid and the papers are perfectly all right, nothing to be ashamed of, but I just didn't perceive them that way. I saw myself by the end of the 70s as being a very sort of, uh, well, you know, a bit of a waste of time. And, and, and eager to go off and something else. I mean, maybe I'm just um, I'm just something of a depressive, I suppose, in, in, this, in this fashion. Not in everyday life, but in scientifically depressive. In fact, in fact, this is quite an important point, come to think of it. So it's often occurred to me that I'm, I'm rather unusual, perhaps, in working out of depression. I've achieved most of the things I have achieved, and heaven knows they're not very much, but I mean, at, at least what I managed to do was always out of a pit of despair. It's somehow, it's only at those times that I got down to it. That's how I got my 2-1, you know, just accidentally. 
um, and that's that's how I got the 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 cell image of the of the of the embryo achieved. There was nothing else I could do. I was at the end of the road. I it was all a waste of time. Wow, I might as well do this. Just bury into it. Did it. And it's quite extraordinary. Why couldn't I do those things and be cheerful at the same time? Because <laughs> <laughs> once it starts, I was cheerful. It's not like I was going on an endless pit of despair. Mm. But it's very much, you know, the thing about when you're, when you're, when you know, when you're down and out, the only way is up. I mean, it's, it's just that feel. And it's that that allows you to take the step slightly beyond what you thought you were capable of, what anybody else was capable of, and you just do it. And it's just sheer concentration. So maybe it's not so unusual, but it's it's annoying that, that one can't be cheerful about it at the time. <laughs> That's a very nice thought. 